Um, I, I love watching people, and I, I just have this kind of, I don't know why, I just observe. Maybe I was, the, I was the, one of the youngest siblings, and so I used to always just grow up watching my older brothers and sisters do stuff, and, and I always used to be like, I'm not doing that, that's dumb, and I would observe stuff, and so I just had that spirit, and one of the things I always uh, was around growing up was sports, and one of the things that always struck me was how much we celebrate when we have a favorite sports team and they, they win. How, how much we, like you look at people who are mostly pretty calm and laid back or like I was always interested in like people, like especially men have, that were never really too um, excitable, always just kind of losing their minds when watching a television screen when a team that they love has victory. And I used to think that was interesting because my mind went to like, you did nothing. <laughs> and yeah, you were like, we did it! I'm like, we? What's going on here? Um, but we do that. We have this, this celebratory nature, and sometimes we focus it on, on sports. Most of the time, it's sports or entertainment, but we have this ability in us to, to kind of celebrate. And I thought of this movie. Um, do you remember watching a movie called Miracle? It was based on a 1980 hockey team, U.S. hockey team. If you guys don't know, uh, Disney made a, a movie. Um, Kurt Russell, I think, plays the coach, Herb Brooks. And the whole movie is about this Olympic team that's made up of amateurs. It's, it's a true story. And they beat the Russians in the semifinals of the Olympics. Anybody remember watching that? Uh, okay. So it was, like, big for the country, and it turned us from, like, gas lines to, like, hope, right? It was a big um, move, move in our country. So, um, but one of the things I loved about the movie is there was a scene with Herb Brooks who was this, like, real sh- strict and, like, mean coach, and all the players hated him. It was, like, really for a reason. Um, he has a scene where once they beat the Russians, everyone's just losing their mind. They're jumping, and they're celebrating, and they're raising their hands, and he sneaks back into the hallway. I don't know if you guys remember. I have a picture of the scene, and he just goes like this. Yes! Like this, and he pumps his fist, and he's by himself, but he's just so, like, accomplished. For the last six months or nine months, he was just focused on this one thing, and he got it, and he was just like, yes! And I always loved that scene, because he didn't want to do it publicly, but, but his, everything in him was just to kind of praise and celebrate. And I also think it's interesting, if you, if you absorb people, um, when we celebrate, most of the time, we raise our hands, we look up, we jump around, we're screaming like this, when we celebrate, when something happens that is good, we, we tend to look up. And I always think it's interesting, when, when we lose, what do we do? We head, head down, and we kind of fall, right? You ever see a team that loses, and they, everyone just drops on their knees or just falls on their face? They just kind of fall in defeat. And here's where I'm going with that. Um, I, I always start with this. Everything I absor- observe in this world, I, I, I think like this. Okay, God is the author of the world. I could logically prove that to you. So, so God is the author of all that is, which means he's outside of time, space, matter. He has created all that is that, that is good, that reflects his nature. God is holy and set apart, which means this need for us to celebrate, that's very much a part of the human experience, was created by God. Just let that wrestle with you. Like that feeling of victory was something God gave us as human beings. Now, now we have taken that feeling and we've created idols and, and celebrated wrong things, but, but that feeling of celebration, he he gave that to us for a reason. And I always think, okay, why did he give us that? Why are we so celebratory when, when something happens, when we feel like we won something or we defeated something? Why is it in us to want to worship and celebrate? Why do we have that as human beings? So David in the Psalms, chapter 21, it's, it's a celebration psalms, but it's actually more than that. It's like a, it's a triumphant psalms. So David is really doing what Herb Brooks does. He's celebrating like this, but what's interesting about David's heart, because we talk about this all throughout the series, David is a man after God's own heart. So even in the midst of victory, David takes that feeling of victory, and he brings that to the Lord, and he celebrates victory by praising God, by worshiping his provision and his protection in that victory, in that feeling He's worshiping the Lord in his victory. He's not worshiping himself. And, and uh, last thing before we get into the scripture. Very interesting that we live in a time where when athletes or celebrities win something, there has been this pattern of them thanking who? God. And I would argue that's right. When you accomplish something, if you are a Christ follower, you're like, listen, God's given me the gifts. It's for him. Um, I, I want to praise the Lord. But what's also interesting is we have a culture right now who's getting sick of that. Have you noticed this? 
Oh, they're just thanking God. And, and I would argue the reason our culture is getting sick of people thanking God is because they worship themselves. So when you win and when you accomplish something, you should give glory to yourself, not to God. And so it irritates their spirits. I think that's pretty relevant. But, but David is going to have victory. Now, now watch what he does in this because I think this joy that David is finding in victory I think he's saying this joy that I have in winning is, is a glimpse into the joy that you offer me that will never cease. So he's saying, yes, I have this joy of victory, but Lord, you have given me greater joy and you offer greater joy than this. And so here's what David says. Let's look at verse 1, chapter 21 of Psalms. O Lord, in your strength the king rejoices, and in your salvation how greatly he exalts. And so David is simply saying, Lord, because I have this victory, I'm going to praise you. It's because of you that I've experienced this joy and victory. It's, it's similar to in Exodus when Moses is walking through the parted sea. And what, does they, what do they do as soon as they get through the parted sea and the Egyptian army is destroyed? What do they do? Do you remember in Exodus? They write a song. They worship the Lord in victory. So when God provides you with victory, the heart of the people of God is to look towards the Lord and say, Father, thank you for your provision and you ultimately getting us here. And so we think of Christ, it is every day of our lives, let me just kind of challenge you with this. Every day of our lives, you can wake up and remind yourself of the victory you have in Christ. And that should bring about in you a great joy that is steadfast if you remind yourself of the victory you have in him. Like, that's why the cross is empty, by the way, church. The cross is empty because the victory has been accomplished. He is in the right hand of the Father, which means it is done. And so he's saying, every joy I have, I'm going to give to the Lord because the victory is found by him. I'm going to praise you and be grateful to you because you are the one who gives me this. So, so here, here's a relevant application. Um, wake up tomorrow... And before you think of the things that make you sad, look at the blessings that God has given you. Look at the things that you never thought you had that you have. Wrestle with the idea that I am saved and that Christ is coming back. And because of that, even if my circumstances are poor today, I can walk in the victory that it is finished. Now look at verse 2. You have given him his heart's desire, and you have not withheld the request of his lips. David is saying, um, I praise you in this victory because I also remember when I was praying to you in the pain. Like many of us struggle with the idea of suffering. If God is a loving God, why is there suffering? But I want to challenge you with one thought. Can we appreciate peace without understanding suffering? Can we appreciate love without experiencing pain. Meaning, that the, the seasons when we don't have victory makes the victory deeper. Like, it's, it's the parent who has prayed for their prodigal child for 20 years will rejoice deeper and louder in the 20 years when the child comes to know Jesus because they remember the 20 years of on their knees praying and asking the Lord to be faithful. And so they'll rejoice in the fact that, Lord, even when I was praying and nothing happened, I'm going to rejoice because you've heard my prayers. David's simply saying, this victory is even greater because, Lord, in the times of worry, this victory tells me that you listened, that you loved me, and that you provided for me. It's a victory of longing to say, okay, Lord, even in the hard times, I can give you praise because you were faithful. Like when my wife and I um, went, went to, man, it's been about two years since we've been here. Um, what you don't know is about two years prior, man, we were praying about this step. And every night, I, I kid you not, every night we would pray and seek the Lord. Lord. Lord, what do you want from us? We were coming from a place of comfort and stability, but we knew God called us somewhere. But we did not know. So there was wrestling, there was nervousness, there was fear of making the wrong decisions. But, but now that God has provided us with Emmanuel and he called us here, these last two years has been nothing but praise. Because every time a soul comes into the Lord here, we rejoice because God was faithful. Not only faithful to my wife and I, but faithful to you as a church. Like here's what I mean. I, I know a lot of you who, who were here when the church wasn't going as well as it's going. 
And you've left meetings and you've left the church feeling like, hey, is, is there a future here? And so what, 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 what I'm trying to challenge you with is remember those days because when you remember those days and you see the lobby today, you should have more joy because God was faithful. Does that make sense? Lord, you were faithful to steward your bride. And so we're going to rejoice now because we knew the journey. And so I just want to remind you of everyone in this room who are in Christ Jesus. I want to remind you of something. Not only is that true in our lives, but everyone in this room is heading towards that day. Like you are heading towards a day where joy and worship and praise will be with you and in you forever and all of eternity. And you will look back on your life and rejoice in the Lord for all that he accomplished in your life. That's where you're heading. Despite where you are right now, the destiny you have is eternal joy and fellowship with the Lord. Every one of you who are in Christ Jesus, that's your destiny. Here's why that's so powerful. That means that if you lost a loved one this year who loves Jesus, though there is pain, there is great hope, is there not? Like, yes, yes, I'm suffering today, but there is joy promised tomorrow and Christ will return so I can be filled with worship because it's not suffering forever. It's temporary pain followed by eternal joy. Did you hear me? And that eternal joy will strengthen your today, will deepen your prayer. All the disciples in the scriptures knew this hope which allowed them to endure martyrdom and persecution because though most of the early church followers we have seen died horrific deaths. Church, look at me. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Every one of those people that we read in the book of Acts that were martyrs, they won. Don't forget, they won. They are, Stephen is in the arms of Jesus, worshiping him forever in glory. So Stephen won. Stephen went through pain and trials and death, but Stephen won. Joy eternal is now where Stephen is. So, so David has this beautiful expression of, Lord, I find joy in your strength and in your provision, knowing that, Lord, you brought me this triumph. But Lord, in you is deeper joy. Now look at verse three. For you met him with rich blessings. You set a crown of fine gold upon his head. What David is acknowledging is, Lord, yes, you have blessed me. You have made me king. You have given me all of the things that you've promised me. He's also probably thinking of the fact that, God, you are a creator of everything. And so, Lord, everything that is good in this world. Every feeling I have that is good has been authored by you. And then I think David's also probably remembering like Abraham and the promises that God has placed upon Abraham and his descendants. And he's like, Lord, we are seeing your goodness and your faithfulness and your provision in all of these things. Now church, here is David pre-Jesus thanking the Lord for all of the joy and triumph that God has given them up to that point in human history. Now church, here's my challenge to you. We have the resurrected Christ as the bride of Christ today. We know God came, lived a perfect life, taught us how to live, and gave us victory over sin and death. It is finished. So then my challenge to you is, what do you have in your life that keeps you from being abundantly, overly worshiping the fact that it is finished? Like, what, what am I in my life, am I holding on to that will keep my heart bitter when Christ says, it is done for me? Because David's finding enough joy and enough hope in who God is, and that's before God rescued us from our sins. So, so church, the, the idea of saying, Lord, the blessings of what you have done for me will guard my heart in joy. Like, I can live in joy because it is finished. I mean, I don't know about you, but, but I, would, I would encourage you to meditate on that. Every day you fail. I would med Those who are struggling with depression and anxiety, do you realize that Christ has rescued you from you? He's rescued you. 
Meaning you can give up control. And you can live. Look at me, I mean this. You can live in his peace and in his joy. Like a never-ending fountain. You can just stay there every day of your life. And you could get sick and stay there. You could lose your job and stay there because what he offers you, Scripture says, the world cannot take. And guys, I have seen this in my life in a practical way that has transformed this idea of where I find my joy, where I worship. I'll tell you the truth. I was, I was a kid who idolized athletics. So I worship sports. I worship the triumph of accomplishment. But let me be honest with you. The more I am falling in love with Jesus, the more discontented I am in that world. The more my heart and my posture towards worship has shifted from the Penn State football team winning a title that had no ability or, or nothing to do with that will not satisfy my soul to wanting to give that same passion to worship because God gives me eternal joy. And that's something I could also be a part of. I could be in heaven with him, worshiping and being in triumphant glory, also knowing that I helped in building his kingdom. And so my shift towards where I find my joy is, is similar to where David is shifting here. He says, yes, I'm a king. Yes, I have victory. But Lord, you are a greater king. You give us greater victory, greater joy. Look at verse four. He asked of life for you. And you gave him, Lord, to him. You gave him the length of his days forever and ever. David is recognizing that God, the giver of all life, can give us something greater than the world can give us. And he can give us something that is eternal, not just temporary. Look at verse 5. His glory is great through your salvation. This is a prophetic aspect of Christ here. Splendor and majesty you bestow on him. It's a reflection of Christ. The idea of hope of glory, that, that in your life, despite where you are, in your marriage, in your job, in your relationship with your addictions, there is a hope that has been offered to you that goes beyond you. It goes beyond you, guys. And it goes beyond your circumstances. When I was doing mission work, I told this story a little bit, but, but I want to highlight something. When I was doing mission work in China, I was blessed to be able to go to this underground church. I just wanted to experience it. It wasn't safe, but I just wanted to experience it because I, I wanted to feel what it was like to worship in the midst of heavy persecution. And I remember being in this environment where, and I tell this story all the time, they had one piece of paper and it was a bunch of verses that were wrong. Like John 3, 16, for the wages of death, you know, wages of sin is death. I'm like, nope, not, not the right verse. So they had misquoted verses and I remember seeing this group of people. This was one of them, my brother. He, he, we were sitting in a small living room. It was his home. And five people were in there, one piece of paper, incorrect verses. And I was overwhelmed by the presence of the Spirit of God and the joy that was in that room. Overwhelmed. To the point where it shocked me because I recognized joy is not found in stuff or situations, or pretty buildings, or religious traditions. Joy is found in the presence of the Lord and the gathering of those seeking it. And it overwhelmed me that there was this access to this triumphant spirit of joy and worship that doesn't have to do with your environment, or the country you live in, or the culture you're in, or even the persecution that you're feeling. Guys, why does this matter? Because as we look to the election year, look at me, the joy is not found in the circumstances. It's not found in the circumstances of our country. We speak truth, we fight for the scriptures and God's way, but our joy is not found in the stability of our country or those around us. The joy is found in the Lord. Joy is not found in whether you're healthy or not. The joy is found in the Lord. And it is greater than those circumstances. And it will outlive those circumstances. And so what David is doing is in the victory of a great battle is seeking greater joy than that. And I love his heart because he says that joy that I'm finding because this victory is temporary. Like how many of you have idolized the world only to find that you get what you wanted and it doesn't satisfy you? 
So you go after that new relationship or that new car or that new boat or that new job and it still doesn't satisfy you. What David is recognizing is yes, there will be temporary pleasures and happiness that comes of this world, like a triumph in battle. But David said, there's greater joy in you. And this joy is eternal and it does not end and it satisfies your soul. Now look what he says in verse six. For you make him most blessed. Look at his language here, forever. And you make him glad with the joy of your presence. The joy of your presence. Now look at verse seven. For the king trusts in the Lord. And though the steadfast love of the most high shall not be moved. David is just remembering the fact that his anchor is in the Lord's love towards him. This is where he's going to find ultimate victory. This is why when Christ comes down and talks about the resurrection, demonstrating to us that it is finished, that you have victory in Christ, that reminds us, like everyone that came in this morning, if you are a brother and sister in Christ, I want to remind you, you come in with a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. Maybe for some of you, July 4th was a hard week. Maybe for some of you, you can't find happiness like you used to as a young person. And so you're struggling to, to, to figure out where you are in your life and what God has for you. I want to remind you, if you are in Christ Jesus, you have been given a joy that you can cling to regardless of your circumstances. And, and I'm not just pretending. I have seen that joy in those in my life that I have no idea, apart from God's provision, how they would have it. Like how many of you can attest to this, where you are blown away by the joy somebody has despite a hard situation? And you're like, this is a divine joy. This is outside of this world. And so David is saying, the Lord's love is what I cling to because it is unshakable in my life. Everything else is shakable, but God's love and God's peace that he can give me is unshakable. That is why, church, when, when we're out in the lobby and a sister in Christ last service says, I'm going into surgery, I have stage four cancer tomorrow. That's why we come alongside of them. We wrap our arms around them and we say, Lord, give them your peace and your joy and guard her. Because despite what happens tomorrow, that will not be lost in her. It's what we cling to. It's what we pray for is the joy that God gives because it isn't temporary like the world. Now look at verse seven. For the king trusts in the Lord and through your steadfast love of the most high, it shall not be moved. Your hand, verse eight, will find all of your enemies and your right hand out of these, you will hate you, will hate you. And you will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. Lord, you will swallow them up in his wrath and the fire will consume them. Look at verse 12. You will destroy their descendants from the earth and their offspring and from among the children of men. Though they are evil against you, though they devise mischief, though they will not succeed, for you will put them to fight and you will aim at their faces with your bows. Okay, what is David doing here? He's saying, Lord, I want to seek your steadfast love, your joy. It's where I'm found. But here's what David's doing here. It's very important. David then stops and says, I'm not ignorant to the pain and suffering of the world. He's not ignorant to the reality that many of you were hurt and abused. And the world has hurt. He's not ignorant to that. In fact, what David says is, I'm not going to hold on to the bitterness and angry anger of what has been done to me because, Lord, you are just. Like some of you, you can't worship the Lord because you're angry at him for not keeping you from the pain you experienced in your past. Did you hear what I just said? You are bitter because you're like, God, you could have kept me from it, but you didn't. So because God didn't do something, you're angry at him. David says, God, you are just, and there will be a time where you will punish all of those deserving of your punishment. Whether it's in this life or the next, justice, Lord, I have given to you. I will not no longer be the justice maker in my life. Lord, you are the justice maker. You will bring justice to those that need to have your wrath. And so David is doing this. He's saying, I'm done holding on to the stuff that keeps me miserable. I'm going to cling to the joy in the Lord and I'm giving it up. I'm done being bitter. I'm going to grab onto the joy I have in Christ. I'm going to forgive 
because I want to walk in your peace. I'm done being identified as somebody that was hurt or a victim. Lord, you will bring justice. I'm a child of God. It's a separation of thought processes. I'm going to cling to the joy, not in the pain. I'm going to cling to the hope, not in what was. I didn't have a good father, but Lord, um, that's okay. I have you now. I was abused as a child, but Lord, I, I'm giving you the justice of what you need to do there to those who abuse me. I'm going to cling to the fact I'm a child of God now. How powerful is that to say, I'm going to cling and claim the joy that's found in Christ Jesus. It's where my identity is going to be. It's where my hope is going to be. I'm no longer going to look at the circumstances of my life and let them define how I worship, how I live, how I love. No longer Christ defines that for me. Look at verse 13. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. Again, guys, man after God's own heart, what is he doing? We're done with the pain. We're going to live in worship. Look at me. We're done with the pain. We're going to live in worship. Because the pain may never go away, but the joy I have in the Lord also doesn't go away. And in fact, what scripture says is there will be a day, you may not believe it, but that pain will go away. In fact, scripture says there will be a time of no mores where God will claim ultimate victory over sin and death and the enemy. So, so we long for that as a believer. We wake up every day and we cling to that. And guys, if we truly receive that, that will give you an anchor that no matter what life throws at you will not rob you of that joy. I promise you that. And what we don't offer here is religious traditions. What we offer here is a living God who wants to bring you joy and peace and transform you. That, that, that's what the gospel offers you. Now I'll prove this to you. I, I probably told this story maybe when I first started here, but it's the greatest demonstration of this reality of what David is doing here that I've ever seen in my life. So I got to use this example again. So, so when I was um, in college at Toccoa Falls College in North Georgia, um, like any college kid, I needed money. And so I went to the student union and I saw this number on the, the board. And so I called this number and this lady named Patricia answers. And Patricia and her sister live kind of in the middle of nowhere in Toccoa Falls. And she says, I would love for you to come by uh, maybe Tuesdays and Thursdays and help me with yard work. We got all these weeds and it's out of control and we can't physically do it anymore. And I said, absolutely. So I go there and they're just the sweetest, most joyful, kind Women, I'm just overwhelmed by, by how amazingly kind they are. And so I, I get there, and like anything, I'm like, I'll do this for free, but I'm kind of poor, so if you have any money. But I was just like, I'm going to do this regardless if you pay me, because I'm not going to like walk away um, from this situation. And so then I started to come every Tuesday and Thursday, and I would, I mean, humid. Anybody been in Georgia? I mean, it's just like, <gasps> can't even breathe. So humid. So I did the garden, and I did all their weeds, and I did their yard for a couple of weeks. I did this, and so much so that they started giving me, like, other projects. So like, do you see that road? Clean that road. And I was like, oh, gosh. And so I would just come, and we would have tea and cookies after, and we would just talk. And so a couple of weeks went by, and then I get this assignment from school. And they say, you are to read this book called The Dam Break in Georgia. I'll throw it up on the screen. And so I'm reading about this book. And so about the, same, about the same time that you had a flood here in Johnstown, there was a flood in Georgia, and there was a dam that broke. And it went through the college and destroyed all of these homes, specifically the homes of the staff of the college. And I'm reading this book, and I hear about the story of this woman named Patricia. And how when the flood came through, she kicked open her window because there was an AC unit in her window. She kicked open the window. She climbed on her roof, rode her roof to a place where she jumped off into the bankment and lived. And then Patricia found out in the hospital that her husband and her three daughters were killed in the flood. So I'm reading about this. Patricia Sproul. Patricia Sproul. And then, and then a thought came to my mind. Um, that, that's the Patricia I work for. 
that's her. So I remember reading this, thinking to myself, I, I, I would have never, never thought this woman experienced such pain. So I remember thinking to myself, how do I, how do I have this conversation? And so I, I, I stop the book, and I go the next day to, to work for her, and I just say, Patricia, I am so sorry. And she begins to tell me about um, how after she experienced that, just, I mean, I can't imagine the tragedy. She went into the mission field for 40 years as a nurse talking about Jesus and being hands and feet for the Lord. So she, she didn't get angry at the Lord. And so I'm overwhelmed by like, how are you still functioning? And so she's smiling with a smile on her face, telling me all the things she has done since that day. So then I go back to college and I start reading the rest of this book. And it says that a, a, a secretary, like a reporter, um, hears about Pat Sproul's story and how she lost her three daughters and her husband like this. And she goes to the hospital and she asks Pat, Pat, how are you still able to function? And the book says, Pat said this to the reporter. My husband and I gave our daughters to Jesus way before they were born. He's just taken them back. And it says in the book that her and others were around the bank worshiping and praising and praying to their God in this situation. And I say to myself, that joy that she has despite that tragedy comes from the Lord. It does not come from man. And it is not robbed regardless of the circumstances. She worshiped God because of this. This is why I know what God is saying to us this morning, what David is seeking, and what Pat knew is so true if you want to run towards it. It is that Pat knew in her heart that though she lost her family today, and why do I know this? Because she told me later. I developed a deep relationship with her and her sister in the years to come. She told me. So, so she knew she lost her babies that day but she will be with them and her husband in eternal worship with the Lord. That's her destiny. So because she has that overwhelming hope of what's to come, she can have joy after something like that. And I just wanna remind you in Christ Jesus, that joy you can cling to this morning, despite your loss, despite your pain, despite your fears. Listen, for those out there that had a hard time during the July 4th weekend, because the, the, the ones you love are gone. If they know Jesus, that is not your eternal reality. Every time I stand up here and do a funeral and that person knows and has claimed the blood of Jesus upon their life, I say this is a temporary pain. We have a hope eternal. And because of that, even in the midst of our pain, we can worship the Lord in spirit and in truth with all of our hearts. And we can worship in prison like Paul. We can worship on the cross like the disciples. We can worship like Pat does despite losing her family because the joy God offers us transcends this world. And so I'm inviting you this morning into that joy. If you don't know Christ as your savior, today is the day to lean in to what he has offered you for free, which is grace, which is forgiveness on the cross. You gotta say, I, I believe. And in that you will start to experience his presence and his promised spirit. And I promise you, if you lean in enough, you will begin to find a joy that you have been robbed from up to this point. And that's what we want for you. We don't want you to join a church building or a denomination. What we want for you is to experience a living God who will satisfy your soul. So what we want to do right now is we're going to transition into communion. So if you have your communion cups, grab them. But, but let me tell you why this is such a significant message as it relates to communion. Um, for some of us, we grew up in a, in a religious system that made this a tradition. This is not a tradition. Look at me. This doesn't save you. What this is, is a reminder 
of what has already occurred. This is a reminder of the hope you have in Christ. This is a reminder of the victory you have in Christ. And it is a reminder, especially in the days and the weeks that are hard. Especially in the years where you find no hope in this world. This is why Jesus wanted us to do this. It is a reminder that it is finished, church. He knows as he sits around the table with the people he loved that this person he's looking at will be speared to death. This person he's looking at will be hung upside down. This person he's looking at would be whipped and beaten. And he knows that that is going to be the reality of this world. But he also knows that if they can cling to what he has done and hold fast to the joy that he offers, everyone in that room will have victory in the end. So that's why he says, remember. Why do we need to remember? Because sometimes it's hard to remember the joy we have. Because it's overwhelming sometimes that the worry and the anxiety of the world. But as a church, I wanna, I wanna cling to this because I don't, I don't know about you, but this, Christ is my blessed hope. Christ is the hope of pastoral. And it is a living hope. It's not a wishful fantasy. It is a living promise. So Christ takes the bread during the Last Supper before he heads to the cross and he holds up the bread and he looks at those he loves and he looks at the church to come, his bride, and he says, this is my body, broken for you. It's bringing hope, peace, joy. He says, this is my body broken for you. Church, do this in remembrance of Christ Jesus. In the same way, Jesus takes the cup holds it up and he says, this is my blood poured out for you. Lord, Lord, I can't, I can't do this anymore, but, but you've given me victory. Lord, I can't overcome my sin without you. But your blood has made a way for me to, to have a relationship with you. Lord, I feel guilty, but your blood has taken my sin and is a reminder of what this blood means church. Take that pain you feel. Take that worry you feel. Process what he has done for you and let it go. He says, this is my blood poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you for the joy and the praise that we live in. But Lord, I pray right now over this room. I pray for those that are not wanting to worship you in triumphant spirits to change today. Lord, let this place be more worshipful than a stadium. Lord, you deserve our praise more than anything in this world. And Lord, we know in eternity that all we will do is praise and worship you. This is what our soul longs for. So Lord, I pray for a shadow of that in this place today pray for hardened hearts to soften. I pray for pain to be replaced by peace, fear to be replaced by your joy. I pray all these things in your name.